Hello, I'm Thelma Larman and welcome to the Tubcast, the very first podcast dedicated to cynic philosophy and the art of simple living. Today's podcast will be hosted by Phil Summers and co-hosts Kevin Patrick Jr. and Don Pepperoni. Enjoy! Welcome to the Cynic Tubcast. This week we're discussing in our inaugural Cynic Tubcast, Cynic philosophy and how we approach this philosophy and how we've discovered it and how it impacts our lives. We're also going to be talking about the differentiation between how we use the word today in the modern era and how it was used back in ancient Greece. And finally we'll be discussing technology and how we as cynics are able to use technology like this podcast to distribute our message and our philosophy and help people discover this philosophy and be happy. So myself, Phil Summers, is the co-host today, and I'm calling in from New Zealand. Uh, we also joined by Kevin in Texas and Don in Germany. Welcome, my co-hosts. How are you today, Kevin? Well, thanks. I'm glad to be here with you guys, and it should be an interesting discussion. Yes, I'm looking forward to it. So, Kevin, tell us, how did you discover cynicism as a philosophy? I discovered cynicism through my study of Stoicism, so I don't self-identify as a cynic, but I do look to it for information about how to inform my study and practice of Stoicism. Since Stoicism was sort of an offshoot of cynicism and a synthesis with Megarian logic, they're definitely, I think, since we do have some holes, since not all of those sources came through history to us today, we can look to our previous heritage through cynicism to find practices and clarifications where Stoicism maybe is lacking. So, it sounds like you've been interested in ancient Greek philosophy for a while, but why philosophy at all? Why any type of philosophy? Why not religion? Why not not Buddhism? Why not other ideas or spirituality out there? The distinction of philosophy versus religion is kind of a newer one, and that's definitely sort of because of the advent of Christianity. And that kind of broke off this idea of philosophy as a way of life and theology and sort of left philosophy only with kind of academic study. So that distinction for the period that we're interested in really didn't exist. Something about Stoicism and sort of Western philosophy just resonates with me and speaks to me a little bit more. It's more readily accessible, I think, than some of the Eastern ideas which don't translate super well uh, to the modern context, for me anyway. So it's just sort of this idea of we need to shape our lives conformably to nature. Philosophy in some ways are therapeutics. If there are things that we're not happy about, uh, philosophy offers us a way to either experience them, monitor them, or change them to hopefully bring us to a better place. So Don, tell us about how you discovered cynicism. Well, that was a kind of like a funny story for me because I approached philosophy in general through martial arts and going from from there to Zen Buddhism was an easy step. And then, you know, like uh, when as soon as you discover that you're you're pretty well, you're not pretty much primed for for stoicism. But I mean, it is a philosophy that really speaks lightly and speaks easily to people who, who like to get into that spirit of bracing themselves, containing themselves, disciplining themselves. And so from there on, it's, it was just, uh, for me at least, a very easy way to, uh, well, I call it a progress, you know, not everybody would uh, would agree with that, from stoicism to cynicism, because I found it really hard, well, sometimes for me it's really hard to, to grasp the over-complexity that stoicism put on its concepts, and uh, I, I found the, the simplicity and the practicality of uh, cynicism really, really attractive, uh, especially because... I don't know, I'm kind of prone to, to find or to, to look or you know, to, just to stumble over uh, bits and gems of philosophy in, in unlikely places. And uh, I read in, in some blog, you know, that the, the basic cornerstones of, uh, of your life are or for, for a fruitful and, and creative life are freedom, simplicity and health. And I really liked that. That, that was a, a concept that really spoke to me. And so I thought, yeah, well, I, I should go and look for that. And, and I think I found it in, uh, in cynicism and, and the concepts of, of a simple life and of, uh, you know, restraining yourselves from, from luxury and, and all that, uh, which is kind of like counterintuitive in, in our nowadays society, but probably the thing we need the most. So, so this is how I ended up here. Interesting. And does your the fact that you come from Brazil, which is kind of a lesser developed country, kind of middle of the road, and now you're living in Germany, which is quite a highly developed country. I was wondering if this had sort of the culture that you're around, if this pushes you into cynicism, as because cynicism is very minority. It's a very niche philosophy. Even Stoicism uh, being a little bit more popular, still quite niche. Is there, is there something that's pushed you into this culturally, to pursuing this philosophy, what you're surrounded by? 
that might be that might come as a surprise. You know, usually you, you'd go, oh well, you, you come from a third world or from a, from a developing country, and so you're used to live by very little, and so that's the reason why you make the best of it and and, and just go for the corresponding philosophy. But uh, the actually the contrary is true. I'm kind of like a middle. I was uh, still am probably a middle class Brazilian, which is not very a densely populated uh, social class there but i mean it's, it's existing and uh so my father was a a physician so we were kind of like well off and coming from this kind of social background and cultural background you're rather highly encouraged you know to consume and uh, you know to to show what you have uh, to be proud of of your comp of your material accomplishments And uh, moving from there to Germany, which is uh, an industrial or maybe maybe even a post-industrial uh, country, you encountered or I encountered uh, growing up and being socialized there, um, a, a society which is highly critical to materialism and, and highly critical to consumerism. So the green movement is, is really big in, in Germany. So coming from Brazil to Germany rather encouraged me, you know, arriving here, getting into the, the German groove and the German spirit, as to say, uh, to, to embrace this kind of thinking of simplicity and, and, and uh, neglecting materialism and consumerism in my life. Very good. I'm wondering, Kevin, the same sort of question for you. Coming from America, we, we kind of, the world kind of uses the American model of capitalism and uh, consumerism And uh, that kind of gets exported around the world. So you're living sort of a, a minimalistic, or taking aspects of a minimalistic philosophy and applying it to your life in a, in a capitalist society. How, do, how does that fit with you? And do you see that as being compatible and in, in coming from Texas, well, Texas or West Virginia, where you're originally from? Sure. Well, I'm actually in exile here in Texas, proud West Virginian. But, I mean, I would separate, firstly, capitalism from consumerism, but that's a separate political discussion. But this consumerist mindset is, I think, really a result of this sort of postmodern problem. So in the last hundred years or so, we have basically stripped away all of the traditional external motivators for people to do certain things. So previously, it would have been uh, religious or otherwise. All of these motivators are outside of us. And in the advent of sort of modern science and the way philosophy has progressed, we sort of pulled that rug out from under ourselves. And so if we're looking for philosophy for a way to apply meaning to our life, I think that that's kind of the definition of the postmodern problem, is a scrambling for meaning. Uh, we're going to find ourselves, I think, necessarily at odds with the wider culture who isn't concerned about that. And I think that's probably a developmentary stage, that you can only fill the hole inside with so much stuff before you realize that you're actually not filling that hole at all. And so I think that necessarily you end up a little bit outside of what's common, but that doesn't necessarily isn't a bad thing. I think if, what's the Mark Twain quote? If you find yourself on the side of the majority, it's time to rethink your perspective. So I think that that's not necessarily a, a bad problem to be in. No, I agree with that. So myself, I came to this because of uh, just things going on in my own life. I discovered philosophy, somehow I discovered Stoicism, and I was instantly attracted to that. I've always been attracted to things after I was brought up, at, raised a Catholic, um, which I let go of when I was about 20 or so. And since then I've been looking for something to fill there. There was a void there that I was trying to just get some sort of guidance from that made sense. And um, I eventually stumbled upon Stoicism, somehow. I was just searching and searching and there was just reading articles online and then I, I think it was through Tim, Tim Ferriss, of all people, uh, who mentioned the Stoics. So then I started looking into that and I discovered Stoicism and I felt like it was just came at a time in my life when uh, I needed some sort of um, direction and, and, and meaning uh, that wasn't religious that wasn't explained by god i suppose because it's not it's not the atheism for me it's just that that type of god the christian god any of those types of god they don't work for me at the moment so um i discovered stoicism and i was studying and studying and i bought more and more books I started to feel like i didn't know any more than i used to know uh, about this philosophy and, and it wasn't wasn't working for me because I, all i was doing was trying to fulfill this thirst for knowledge so then i took an interest in cynicism because that's where stoicism originated from under zeno of citium uh, he, he was with crates of thebes around 400 bc or so and it just made much more sense it's far more simpler philosophy cynicism and it made a lot more sense there's a lot more practical applications there's things i can do in my life day to day and part of that is minimalism 
part of that is just right thinking, part of that is just knowing thyself. It all just made sense, so I took an interest in this, and a year later we started a podcast, so <laughs> it makes sense and I'm sticking with it, and it's it's simple philosophy for me. So that's my own journey, as convoluted as it is, but we're here, all of us. It's good to hear your own stories of how we got here, and because we're interested in this cynicism, this cynic philosophy, I'd like to explore the words, the two meanings of cynicism, how we currently use it, and how it was originally meant. Maybe it would be a good place to start with Don, because in German, it's not a problem for you, like it is in English. In English, we speak about cynicism, with the capital C being the ancient philosophy, and we talk about modern political cynicism, where we don't trust anybody, where we don't believe any what anybody has to say, and we don't believe anybody has good intentions. That's lowercase cynicism. So I think it's good to, to, to get a clear understanding of what the difference is between these two. So how is it in German, Don? Well, in German, is uh, well, th that's probably one of the very few things uh, that is simpler in German than in English. So in uh, in German, we have denomination of the philosophy of cynicism is is written in a, with a K and a, a capital K. So it's and it's called Kynismus, which is pretty close to the Greek uh, origin of the word. The word and um, so and and the lower case C from English is written with a Z in in German and uh, that's called Zynisch. So that's that's a totally different writing style, and you already know, like at a glance, oh, we're talking about the philosophy. Oh, we're talking about the mindset. You know, like the the, the nihilistic mindset of not trusting anybody, being you know, like making fun of everything and, and 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 not believing in anything. So that makes it really easy. You know, when I when I wrote, for for example, when I wrote for the uh, to to my friend, you know, to um, to to give uh, his music as an intro to our podcast, you know, and I explained to him, yeah, well, you know, I got interested in philosophy and uh, and this podcast is about kinismos. He already he instantly knew we we're not going to make, you know, like sleazy jokes about anybody. It's like, a, it's, it's like a kind of, you know, a philosophy, an ancient philosophy kind of thing. So that's the easy thing we have in the German language uh, in regards to, to uh, cynic philosophy. And Kevin, in America, we see, I think most of the time that I would uh, use the word cynicism, lowercase, in the modern sense, would be in politics. That you can be cynical of a policy or a government or a, a political party. And you're just looking for the negatives. You're looking to shoot them down. Would you say this has got any relation to, to the ancient Greek word of cynicism? No, I don't think so. Uh, the classical Greek word is kunikos, and it comes from dog. And so Diogenes was the dog philosopher. And early Christianity, especially the early Christian apologists, often started the phrase of using cynic as basically a way to say godless atheist in a way that wouldn't necessarily say that. So it's a very old tradition for using this title and a word as sort of a, a jab or you know, some sort of pejorative. It's very difficult for us to separate the two because we have this incredibly long history of using the little case word C, cynic, in this way. And so people might have a perspective of, well, either they suspect that nothing is worthwhile and it's kind of an apathetic situation, or that no one is operating with good intentions, which either means you shouldn't participate or the slightly even less virtuous, there's no reason you shouldn't behave the same way. So it, it kind of, I think it lends a, a culture of corruption for that respect. And, and that has really nothing to do with what we're talking about here. The prime purpose of cynicism is that virtue is the only good, full stop. There's no mediation of that. There's no category of preferred or dispreferred indifference. It's in many ways truly black and white. And anything that's artificial that changes the way of man's natural state uh, inherently falls on the wrong side of that line. So that puts us in an interesting perspective because the lens is so clear. For us, it's pretty clear that we have we have the mindset, which is a not a, considered a very friendly one. I think that's a general understanding on that. And we have the philosophy, which is uh, actually hold in high re in high regard in Germany. So, but we discovered that with our um, studies in in our little Facebook group already. But Diogenes, even representing a niche philosophy, is is a is one of the philosophers which is mostly depicted, you know, like in over art, paintings and all that. And uh, so, obviously, the kind of well, I don't want to even call it a self denial. It's, it's it's rather you know like a you know a self approving way of presenting yourself to towards the world. You know, like being just you speaks to a lot of people. It's just that most people don't really have, let's plainly say it, you know, the guts to go to not only to talk the talk, but also to walk the walk, you know, but even nowadays, you know, like we have lots of, of, of discussions about that, you know, like in, in a whole lot of forums, you know, 
well, you know, Diogenes was only a bum, you know, and uh, he was just like living out on, on on other people's expenses and everything. So we already heard that and read that and uh, and a whole lot of of discussions online. But that's just not not true in that way. Going into yourself and relying only on yourself is probably a need very many people have. But maybe Kevin has some ideas about that. Well, my question was, since we were talking about how the ancient cynics lived, and the idea there is that they're free from most of the things which tie other people down. And that freedom from gives them a freedom to. So they can uh, speak freely, they're beholden to nobody, they can travel, they're not tied down. And it, there's this relationship between freedom from and freedom to. But they did sort of renounce a lot of, of worldly things. And so I think that a, a simple charge that someone might levy against people who are interested in cynicism in a modern context is, well, how can you even have a podcast using computers and global information networks and all of the things that are required to do something of this scale and tell people they should live more simply. Do you think that presents a problem for modern philosophers? Well, I don't think so at all, because even back in ancient Greece, we had the likes of Diogenes, Antisthenes before him, Crates, Zeno, they all wrote stuff. And they all wrote this on papyrus. Now, papyrus isn't cheap. From what the research that I've done online to look at uh, the cost of papyrus and modern day money, it's about $40 per sheet. So if you've got 10 sheets to write a book or to send 10 letters around, then that's going to cost you about $400. That's about the same price, even a little bit more than my Chromebook here where I'm talking to you on. Now, they wrote these these documents, uh, all, of, all of Diogenes' writings and, and most of Crates have been lost to time. But even after them, we have the growth of cynicism and it's spread and it, it's grown quite a lot. Even though we don't have these famous names anymore, we don't have these philosophers' names uh, like we do with Diogenes or Crates. These, uh, the names are gone, but we still have a lot of cynic philosophers. And uh, they wrote these pseudo letters called the, the Cynic Epistles, where they wrote in the style of, of Diogenes or Crates. And uh, it bodied a lot of the craft that Diogenes uses, short stories to give a, a short, sharp message. And they wrote these, and they, the, the cynics wandered right across the Roman Empire. And they brought these letters with them. And if they were talking to an illiterate crowd in a village, anywhere from Palestine to Spain, they were able to, to spread this message of cynicism, that, that less is more, that you can be happy, that happiness is attainable if you follow this philosophy. So they were, they were out there spreading this message with the written word on papyrus, and they're wandering around and sharing their message. And it's not too different to what we do on Facebook. We share links, we share stories, we're, we're sharing, creating podcasts and sharing that. We're just using the technology that's available to us today. So I, I don't see a problem there. I don't think the cynics were Luddites at all. Luddites, they weren't anti-technology, they used that papyrus, the technology of the time, just like we are doing now. What's also possibly interesting is that, I don't know if it's the influence of sort of the Abrahamic faiths, or something else, but we expect a 100% or 0% solution. They're, they're, we don't really accept the idea of making progress or working incrementally. When someone says, I'm interested in bettering myself in this way, we really expect like a 180 degree turnaround and we expect perfection in folks. So while the cynics are out there arguing for more freedom, for more natural living, people will sort of poke at that and say, ah, well, you're still wearing a cloak and that requires a weaver. You're still eating lupin beans, even though you only soaked them in the water to make them eatable, you didn't you know, cook them. So you're still tied to this. People like to kind of poke and say, well, this isn't perfect enough to meet your own criteria, which is a little bit of a straw man because it's their criteria. So I think that as long as we're arguing for more simplicity and more authenticity and more freedom, uh, we don't necessarily expect, nor is it reasonable to expect the ultimate attainment of that at least right away. So to me, I don't see necessarily a, a difference between using uh, this sort of technology to have this discussion and the person who wove the cloak to keep the, the chill off. Yes, that's definitely another way to look at it. Where the, the cynics pushed self-sufficiency. Like, they wanted to be self-sufficient. They didn't want to rely on anybody else. They didn't, like, Diogenes encouraged people not to marry so that they remained self-sufficient. They could look after themselves. But they can never live without society. Like you said, they need the cloak. They need to beg so at times to go to the market to buy the, uh, the lupins that they were surviving on. So they, they, they're not completely removed from society. But they aim for it, and that's admirable in, in a sense too. They're, they're, they're aiming for something, and yes, they're falling short in practice, 
but in the, in their aiming for it, they they are happy. You know, they they you know they 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 do achieve goals. They're free, um, and freedom is a big part of cynicism. We see that with uh, Alexander and Diogenes. They they cry about asking Alexander. Diogenes asking Alexander to step out of his son. That's um. It's all about freedom. It's all about kingship. It's all about that sort of thing. And to tie it back in with the technology, we are never going to be completely self-sufficient. We do need these things. I guess, in a sense, cynicism is a evangelical sort of philosophy. There is this positive message, and we can spread that. So we ought to spread that by whatever means that is, because we aren't completely self-sufficient. We should. We we do believe as cynics that people are good. They are really good. They've just gone been led astray by civilization by things that make us weak, luxuries and pleasures. And if we spread this message, we can help people. So we ought to spread this message. And we can do that by papyrus or this technology. Don. Yeah, well, I think there's a, a good parallel to another group which is also using technology, even though uh, proposing a totally different type of lifestyle, which are the minimalist guys, who are really try to s spread the message, a tiny house movement with the decluttering and liberating yourself from stuff and all that. They do all that, but they still maintain the communication lines via the Internet and via, for example, Facebook or podcasts or whatever. So we have to regard this as a tools of communication, and, and we are lucky enough nowadays, as we are proposed uh, citizens of the world as cynics, that we can do that on an international, on a, on a worldwide scale. I mean, look at us, you know, like we we have uh, we have you, Phil, in, in in New Zealand, and we have Kevin in Texas, and we have me in Germany, and we are talking about cynicism right now, which is exactly appropriate for a philosophy which propagates we are all citizens of the world, which was at the time a revolutionary thing. And that was when you when you find yourself of being Athenian or Spartan or whatever, and that was a big part of your core. And there was this one dude, or at first it was just like this one guy, you know, like saying, no, 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 I'm, I don't belong to the city. I belong to the world. So we are, I think, basically obliged to use worldwide communication possibilities you know like to spread the word and we also have uh, we are in the in the lucky position to like i said for the minimalist lifestyle guys or or for the other ones you know like in the political sphere the anarchists uh, who defy authority that we might be able to show you know like the, the basic underlining you know like backbone of this kind of mindset so we are really like in the position to to um, to offer something and we should. As long as we have something to say, we should say it. So one of the things that's interesting about how Diogenes posits the citizen of the world issue is that, just like you said, their Greek identity was heavily tied to the city-state. And in, he coined this term, you know, that he was cosmopolites, that he was this world citizen. And using that translation for world is, is a newer thing. So, you know, the cosmos is a much larger concept. But he could have said that he was apolites, that he didn't have a citizenship. But instead, he posits that basically the entire community of all existence is a citizenry. And that kind of presages uh, the later Stoic conception, which changed a bit, and even then the modern sort of conception of, of the kingdom of God through you know Christianity. So Diogenes was really very forward thinking, and it was a major shift from sort of ancient thinking to modern thinking. And... What's particularly interesting is that Diogenes cosmopolitanism is a little bit different than the Stoic cosmopolitanism. It's he also says he's a citizen of Diogenes. Crates calls himself a citizen of Diogenes, and they're this you know community of the wise. They're the, they're the real humans. They're the ones who are sort of doing it right, and that ability of of being correct and being the best at what they're doing is why Diogenes can tell the king of the known world to step out of his sunlight. And that ability to view oneself, and that's really sort of a self-esteem issue that, that comes from inside, uh, is what allows Diogenes and then later cynics to have this parhesia, this freedom of speech, that they can speak truth to power, which ties them, I guess, in some ways to sort of like the anarchists that Don was talking about. And all of those ideas are sort of tied together in this idea that really puts him counter the general consensus of, of his people. And so that's one of the things about cynicism I think is, is really interesting, is there's this connection of ideas that isn't necessarily apparent on the surface. But it's not only that. I mean, it's also a, the, an appearance of ideas, a reappearance of exactly these ideas 
in an ordinary world, talking about speaking truth to authority, neglecting or even disregarding authority. Or we have, we have like tendencies uh, like this all over the place in, in modern day in society, which is sometimes even surprising. I will talk about that in a later podcast. But uh, if you look at, for example, the the straight edge punk movement or the anarchists or the um, uh, anarcho primitivism uh, movement, these are all movements who could easily tie into into cynicism and benefit from their thinking and from the rationale. And it also shows that there is obviously a necessity and a striving and a longing for simplicity in our nowadays life. Definitely. Good point you raised as well about who sh- would benefit the most from this, this philosophy. I mean, we've found it. We've found it through whatever links we've made on Facebook and through Stoicism um, and whatever research we've done. But who uh, would we spread this message to, do you think, Don? I don't feel comfortable excluding anybody. We will use, obviously, the internet to spread it, and we will reach probably the, the most unlikely fellow who, who really thinks, yeah, well, that struck a chord with me. I, I'm just going to grab myself a book and, and read about that. This is this, this kind of... I don't, I don't really see it. Even looking as, uh, at us, for example, the, the admins of the group in, in Facebook, I don't really see a common pattern. There, there are people like from all walks of life who are interested in that and who really could benefit from, from more simplicity and from more freedom and from more health in their life. I would encourage people who are practicing or interested or self-identify as Stoics to learn more about cynicism and Diogenes. If, there's a pretty sharp difference between the Hellenic Stoics and the later Roman Stoics. And if you're reading, say, Epictetus's discourses, Epictetus holds Diogenes in high regard, and he uses him as an example of the ideal sage quite a lot, actually. There's a few instances where he's actually talking with a, a would-be cynic, but the would-be cynic is copping out. He's calling himself a cynic and not doing any of the labors. So Epictetus is sort of presenting what the ideal cynic should behave, but really that's an extension of how the ideal philosopher should behave. So there's definitely this trend in modern Stoicism, which is kind of, don't tell anyone, but Epicureanism in disguise. It's true. It's true. I, I keep saying this myself. <laughs> these sort of hedonist Stoics. <laughs> these hedonistic Stoics who, who want their never-ending parade of sensory input, who want to enjoy all of their luxuries. And that's really contrary to the way the philosophy for everyone who actually lived it did it. And... There is some lacking material there for modern Stoics. So looking back at the Cynics, uh, for what the Cynic labors, the voluntary austerities and, you know, ascesis, uh, asceticism, you know, this, this practicing of the body and mind, I think is definitely worthwhile. So I would highly encourage um, Stoics to investigate cynicism, if for no other reason than to steal all the good parts and run away. Yeah, well, there's an element of eclecticism there too. For me, uh, it's, the, it's the Christians. I think that it would benefit most from cynicism. There's this theory that keeps popping up, and as we've discussed it a few times now on our uh, follow, uh, Facebook page, about how Jesus was a cynic philosopher, and if he wasn't, that he was a Jew who was influenced by cynicism. And there's a lot of parallels there, you know, all through, you know, the accounts we have of him. He has a very minimalist and uh, simple lifestyle he overturns the the money lending tables at the temple this isn't too different from diogenes defacing the currency um you know he there's a lot of him telling his disciples to go barefoot and spread with nothing but a well, they don't even need a wallet they're just to go forth you know basically whatever they're wearing barefoot without a wallet and spread the message and um this is quite cynic in, it, in its origins and it's it's a world away from what we see christians today if you look at the vatican where the pope is it's just gold everywhere um we've got a lot of wealthy christians in the world um businessmen and it's just a world away from ancient christian uh christianity or the message that jesus put forward and in some ways i see the same things you know the same difference between ancient cynicism and the word, how we use the word cynic today, they're just, it's the same word, very, very different. So yeah, I think Christians would benefit a lot from looking into cynicism as, as an origin uh, for, for Jesus. Earlier, I had mentioned sort of the, the Christian apologists and using cynic as, as a pejorative jab, but they were sort of split-minded on this because in, on one hand, they would talk out one side of their mouth and they would decry decry the cynics, and on the other, mostly for their lewd, lewd public behavior. But on the other hand, they would talk about the sort of presaging uh, modern Christian poverty, 
and there was this huge debate in the 1200s about whether um, an actual vow of poverty was required for grace or salvation. And so, you know, the, the cynic example features strongly there. And you can still find sects of Christianity where that kind of voluntary austerity is part of the religious practice. And it is probably definitely something that could get some wider currency. Definitely. So I think to round out then, we've got the Stoics who would benefit, we've got Christians who would benefit, and uh, minimalists would benefit. Anybody interested in minimalism could add a bit of depth to their philosophy by uh, by taking up an interest in cynicism. Do you, do you th would you agree with that, Don? I would totally agree with that. The problem you have nowadays when you join yourself to a, a, some kind of like, let's call it that, lifestyle group is that you lack exactly that, what you're just mentioning, you know, like you lack that in your world, you know, like, oh, everybody else is doing it and it's kind of like hip and whatever, you know, and I do it too. But no, there is obviously uh, so, some good in that, you know, there's some good in, in decluttering, there's some good in denying consumerism. But to stick to it, in order to stick to it, 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 I found at least it's really easier if you have some backbone, you know, like if you have something to fall back onto, you know, like some, some stuff you can read. You know, I read up on that and uh, I, I feel I have, I have more power now and, and I have more conviction after, after reading Diogenes or after reading Kratis that I should, you know, continue on that way because that way is good and that way is, is something I should pursue further because it's not only good for me, it's also good for everybody else. Thank you for listening in and I'd like to thank my co-hosts Kevin in Texas and Don in Germany for tuning in and hope you've enjoyed listening to the Cynic Pubcast. Thank you very much.